Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Hello, this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring in Seattle, USA, and this is podcast number nine. I've been doing this, gosh, for nine weeks now. It is now, uh, as this is airing, I should say, it is December 15th, 2016, and I'm actually in Santa Barbara, California as this is airing because this is not live. This is pre-recorded. I am excited. I'm going to visit some relatives in Santa Barbara, California, who invited me on my dad's side of the family. Uh, I'm originally from San Diego, California, was born there. And then my parents divorced when I was four. And when I was nine, my mom decided we would move up to Washington State. No, Washington. (laughs) Washington. Washington. And I have missed California ever since, off and on, but I haven't moved back there. But Santa Barbara is somewhere that I'm going to enjoy swimming in a heated pool. And I've got my waterproof camera that I'm going to bring with me. And I'm going to walk on the beach and I'm going to rest. I rarely take vacations. I've been working for the last 14 or 15 days in a row. This week, I think I had a, let's see, I think six out of seven of the days I worked this week were medical modeling jobs. And when I say medical modeling, what I mean is I pretend to be a patient for med students. And they hire both men and women to practice uh, on. And they pretend to give us examinations and they practice their their palpations, which is how they physically touch the patient, how they palpate the tissue, as they say, in med school. And I'm, I model in this way at two different medical schools near Seattle and been doing it for about 19 years off and on. I started art modeling 24 years ago. And what that means is I'm nude and they draw me and they paint me. And I guess this monologue right now, I've had a couple different requests from different people to talk about nudity and to talk about body comfort and body acceptance and body positiveness that allows me to be a nude model for artists as well as being basically nude in front of medical students in a medical setting. Uh, professional medical type setting. I guess um, I guess I don't realize that not everybody is comfortable with their body because I have uh, been modeling for so long and it just feels so normal to me. I remember I took figure drawing classes when I was 17 years old straight out of high school and I was also exposed. Um, I have a very liberal artistic minded family generally speaking, and I um, was surrounded by art history and art and was never taught to think that nude statue, like the statue of David by Michelangelo and, you know, nude Renaissance paintings. I was never taught that there was anything wrong or shameful or sinful. I was also not raised religious. I was not raised, I we didn't go to church on Sunday. I was not raised with any kind of um, sex is a sin, heaven and hell, Adam and Eve. I wasn't taught any of that. So my dad is very kind of agnostic and not religious at all. And I think even my grandmother wasn't religious, even though she comes from the generation that usually is. I think there's Irish Catholic people on my mom's side of the family but I, d- I wasn't really raised with religion. My mom is, is into Eastern philosophy and Zen Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta non-duality, but she's not into any kind of uh, religious um, superstitious ideas about sex or heaven or hell. Um, the kind of spirituality my mom kind of raised me with is more philosophical, more like Krishnamurti, more like question everything and be in the present moment and have direct experience with consciousness and reality. So I wasn't taught to think that the body was shameful, that the 
the the different body parts, the nipples, um, the genitals of the man or the woman, or a transgender or anyone who hermaphrodite, any kind of person, male or female, or anywhere in between on the spectrum of gender. I wasn't raised, thankfully, to think any of that was shameful. Um, I'm also not ashamed of the the um, digestive system. I guess I have a very body positive um, feeling and modeling nude in front of artists came very naturally to me partly because of the way I was raised by open-minded parents who use common sense and didn't teach me any religious dogma thankfully uh, but also because I was raised um, and I had a lot of good art teachers in school in high school and my mom put me in alternative grade school so I think that I kind of felt like and I took figure drawing classes again but I'm more of a designer and I'm more of a into non-representational painting and drawing and color and design although I was very very good at mimicking and mixing colors and matching photos when I painted I can match color in a very realistic way but I was never very patient or even interested in measuring and drawing. I used to draw the figure model and my proportions were way off and I didn't really care. Like I wasn't really wanting to get them realistic and I would have had to work, work really, really hard to learn the master of drawing realistically and I had no desire to do that. I admire people who have the skill, who have the talent, who and or work hard at getting good at it. But if your goal with art is not realism, then I think there's no reason to think that you have to master realism before you do anything abstracted. I am a natural abstract artist and I was kind of raised actually, my mom kind of tends to prefer abstract design, color and shape. She's a very good designer. So maybe I'm a little biased against realistic art, which is funny because I model for people who are mostly interested in creating realistic art. And it's actually helped me appreciate realism more by being a figure model. Although I love it when kids draw me, I actually like drawings that are out of proportion. I like abstract um, colors and shapes and I appreciate realism. But when I look at a piece of art, I care more about the heart and the soul and the feeling that goes into it and the composition and the color more than I care about the perfect uh, perfecto realism that people create. Um, but I did switch over from being the drawer to being the model and I much prefer being the model. I remember my first figure modeling job was in Seattle uh, at Cornish College of the Arts in the year 1991 or 1992. I really don't know if it was which year it was, 91 or 92. And I modeled for this man's class. I think it was 1 to 4 p.m. And I remember being told to do a 15 minute pose. I remember before that, this was my first modeling job ever. And I showed up with a robe and with comfortable sandals that I can easily take on and off. And I, I basically just, they said, okay, can you do one minute gesture poses? And thankfully I already knew what that meant because I took drawing classes and I knew gesture poses mean that you do action poses. And basically you hold something that you could only really hold for a minute. So you really twist and turn and bend and hold your arms and legs up and you know do do things that are kind of physically difficult that really stretch your muscles that you can really only hold for a minute and then you would start hurting so basically I did gesture poses I twisted it and I turned and I remember feeling a little bit shy and a little bit embarrassed for like the first five minutes and then I was like oh well this is normal okay I get I get how to do this and then when he told me okay now do a 15 minute pose my only concern was I was afraid I would have an itch and I was afraid that if I scratched an itch it would ruin the pose because they were wanting me to stay really really still and they're drawing me and so I didn't want to move to ruin their pose and then I quickly realized that if I had an itch I could just ignore it but I could also scratch so if, you, if you're a figure model and you're doing a long pose you can scratch 
and then as long as you get right back into the pose so don't forget where you put your arm if you're gonna scratch and so I learned very quickly actually what I could do and not do uh, for 15 or 20 minute poses the longest pose I've ever done was a 15 day pose six hours a day for Monday through Friday three weeks in a row and it was for a super realistic class at Gage Academy of Fine Art here in Seattle um, and by this really great artist named Tony Ryder I think he goes by Anthony Ryder or Tony Ryder I'm not sure um, he's a great person to work with and he had them um, doing a portrait painting of me very very realistic very uh, focused on detail and capturing my likeness as well as just making it look like a real three-dimensional portrait of a person so I remember sitting in a chair for three weeks uh, basically 9 30 to 12 30 every morning and then 1 30 to 4 30 every afternoon Monday through Friday uh, so six hours a day times 15 days so I guess that is um, six times five that's a 90 hour pose yeah so I did a 90 hour pose that was the longest pose I've ever done I've also done one ones where I show up um, every week for 10 weeks in a row for three hours every week the same pose that's a 30 hour pose you basically just have to pick something that's comfortable enough to hold for 20 minutes and then they give you a five minute break and then you go back into the same pose for 20 minutes and then you get another five minute break and then usually halfway through the class there's a 15 minute break and sometimes there's a four hour class you get like a 20 or 30 minute break halfway through the class and the whole class takes a break right along with the model so basically I learned very quickly when I first started modeling in 1991 or 92 I started learning very quickly what I can and can't hold you know if I sit a certain way my entire leg falls asleep and the circulation gets cut off uh, from my hip and some models can twist and turn in ways that their limbs don't fall asleep I've noticed but for me I have to sit in a certain way or my leg will fall asleep so there's only certain poses that I do I'm actually not particularly flexible some models can do the splits and bend and contort themselves I am not really known for that what I'm known for is just being very strong and having a lot of stamina um, looking sort of a Nor like a Nordic Viking strong type woman kind of voluptuous kind of muscular but definitely extra curves around my belly that's kind of my body type I'm about five foot eight and a half or nine um, and I have noticed that I I uh, basically started modeling and I sort of taught myself how to do it although I already kind of knew because I had observed many figure models by taking drawing and painting classes and I had painted and drawn the model before so I kind of knew what the poses were like and I looked at a lot of art history books and took art history classes and I you know very educated about art and so I kind of knew what kind of poses would be good but I mostly just make it up and so I uh, basically uh, hooked into a network of many many different art schools many many different instructors things get spread by word of mouth I sometimes got jobs uh, going to art supply stores and looking at bulletin boards looking at ads online mostly it's just through word of mouth you know instructors if you're a good model then people say hey Shannon Kringen is a good model let's hire her again and so basically I think I've been such a successful model because I've been really been doing modeling full-time for my job since 1997 I started in 91 or 92 and I had another part-time job alongside modeling I mean uh, yeah alongside modeling but I switched to just full-time freelance modeling in 1997 and I've been low income my whole life so I, I don't even know what it's like to make a you know a normal amount of a salary you know I've never really made a lot of money in my life so to me I'm used to kind of being low income uh, but I can pay all my bills and so I don't really feel poor but I guess by mainstream standards I am poor and low income 
but I, I, uh, I live in an apartment by myself with my cat and I'm able to pay all my bills and I was able to buy a used car and I, let's see. So I wanted to focus on talking about nudity. So I am comfortable being a nude model in front of drawing and painting and sculpture um, classes. I've also worked with photographers as a nude model. Uh, briefly tried to break into large size fashion modeling, but that's really not my forte, not my cup of tea, not really a big fashion person. Never really tried very hard to do that and just kind of gave up on that. But I have worked with some amazing photographers. I do say that some of the best photos of me are the ones that I take of myself. And that's partly because I'm not afraid to ham it up when I'm by myself. And I know my best angles and I know good design and lighting. So I love to do self-portraits, but I have worked with some really great talented photographers over the years. And so I modeled at that one art school and then I got a network of, of uh, instructors and I just kept calling them and people kept hiring me and it just kind of snowballed. And it's been so long, you know, 1992 or 91, 24 years ago. It just feels normal to me, although I do have a tendency to worry about my schedule filling up, but for the last 24 years, it's been busy enough so that I can support myself. And I'm just very comfortable being nude. I, I don't really wear a robe anymore to my, my art model jobs. What I do is I have a, a dress, like sort of a cotton dress that's easy on, easy off. And I basically just use the restroom before I start modeling and I just put my, my dress on with nothing underneath. And then I have my comfortable sandals that I wear that slip on and slip off. And I always have my water bottle with me. And basically I have a hair tie so I can put my hair up or take my hair down depending on what they want. And I just show up to many, many, many different venues, private art studios, um, many, many different art schools around Seattle. I've modeled in Portland, Oregon. I've modeled in Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, San Diego, California, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, New York, New York City, uh, Brooklyn, New York. You know, I've, I've done little modeling jobs here and there, mostly in Seattle, though. And I am very, very grateful. My income tax is rather complicated with a mix of 1099s and W-4s or W-9s or whatever you call them. But basically modeling is, I've also worked with other models. Sometimes there's a male or female model. There's also the gauge drawing jam, which is a great thing in Seattle that happens every December on a certain Saturday. And it's like, gosh, uh, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So that's like a and nine hours. And there's many different models. Some of us are clothed, some of us are nude. There's costume, portrait, figure, long pose, short pose, sculpture, drawing, painting. And I just wanted to talk about the comfort of being nude in front of people. I guess I just don't worry about it. Like, you know, I wish that my body was more perfect and that I was more perfectly fit. I've actually had breast reduction surgery. So I actually have scars on my breasts. I don't know how many people know that. I used to have very, very large breasts. And in 1993, Right after I started modeling, I got a breast reduction surgery. And so I do have scars. My body is certainly not perfect, uh, but I do exercise a lot and eat fairly healthy and have fairly good DNA. And I'm about five foot eight and a half or nine. And so I'm sort of Nordically built and kind of muscular and kind of curvy, fairly strong, fairly healthy. Um, I love to daydream. I love to hold still. I don't mind people looking at me and drawing and painting. It feels normal. Um, in some ways, I'm kind of shy, like in social uh, party type events. I'm not real comfortable socially sometimes, but I'm somehow very comfortable being on a modeling platform in front of lots of people. You know, sometimes when I model, there's only one or two people drawing me. And other times there's a huge room of probably the most people I've ever, ever modeled for uh, is like 50 or 100 people in one room, like at the Gage Drawing Jam, like a big event like that. There's live music and there's tons of people in the room all drawing at the same time. 
I notice that the sound of the charcoal I find kind of soothing. So when I model, I just feel kind of like I really appreciate the creative learning environment. And I, I sometimes if I have the energy and I'm in the mood, I walk around the room and I look at the art that people make of me. And I've also enjoyed seeing models that I recognize. If I walk down the hall, I see drawings and paintings of other models that I know. So I'm like, oh, I recognize that model. And so that's interesting to see. And so I enjoy the full spectrum variety that I see. You know, there's beginners who are just starting to learn how to draw. And there's there's master artists who are extremely good. Some people are going after capturing a likeness of me. Some people um, are going for something more abstract. And some people, yet again, don't really care if it looks like me per se. They just want it to look like a real person and, and three-dimensional. So as long as it looks like a real person, it doesn't matter if it looks exactly like the model or just like a person. I've also noticed that when people draw me and paint me, sometimes the painting, it, the artwork looks like a combination. It looks almost like me and that person had a kid together. <laughs> it's kind of like a little bit of them because they know their own face so well, a little bit of me mixed together. So it's interesting to see what people create. Uh, I am happy and proud of myself for the work that I do. Figure modeling also is sometimes very painful. You know, sometimes you have to do poses and then certain parts of your body start aching. And usually after all day, if I model all day, like six or nine or 10 hours a day, sometimes I do three jobs in one day, I tend to feel like I have jet lag after that. Like I kind of feel disoriented, like I don't know what time it is and like I need to go for a walk. You know, like if you sit on an airplane for like nine hours and you're just sitting there pretty still and then you get off the airplane and you kind of feel tired like you want to take a nap and yet you kind of feel like you want to go for a walk because your legs have been just sitting still for so long that you feel, you know, like you want to get some exercise and get your blood flowing. So that's how it feels if you model all day. So modeling is actually a very difficult job in some physical ways. I find it psychologically comforting. I have a tendency to worry a lot and be really like OCD and ADHD and stuff like that. And it's hard for me to be in the present moment. I'm always in the past or the future. And I notice when I model, I can meditate. I can like tune in to the, to the present and I can listen to the sound. Usually it's fairly quiet in the room where I model or maybe they have some classical or jazz music playing or just some random interesting music. That's one thing over the last 24 years, I've gotten to hear lots and lots and lots of different music that I probably would have never heard otherwise. I love music. So it's fun to be in a room where they're playing music and they're drawing and painting. So they're learning how to make art, but they're also just being creative and having fun. And so it's a combination of a learning environment mixed with a kind of free, fun, enjoy life type of environment. It's a very positive uh, place to be when, you, when you're in an art room, an art studio, it feels really good. So plus I grew up with a mom who's an artist and she always had a studio. And so she doesn't do like, you know, figure drawing or painting or anything realistic like that. But just the atmosphere of an art studio feels very normal to me. I, I grew up, you know, from like a little tiny baby being in my mom's art studio. So I feel normal when I'm in an art studio. And as for people looking at me, I guess it, it doesn't always occur to me that that's not the normal thing. To be nude in front of people and have everybody staring at you is not what most people do for a living. But I'm so used to it, it I find it uh, comforting. And I find that it's easier to hold still if there's 20 or 30 people in the room and they're all looking at you and drawing and they're concentrating and measuring it makes it a lot easier to stay still because they they really need me to stay still. And what they do is they put tape around my hands and my feet and, you know, different areas so I can get back into the pose. Or like if I'm sitting on a stool or a chair, they will put tape down on the platform so that we can recreate the pose after the break. And so basically the timer goes off and then I'm on a break and the timer goes off again and that means get back on the model stand. And so I'm sort of trained when I hear a timer, you know, start posing again. 
and they usually say model posing and then everybody gets back and concentrates. So that's kind of what it's like being a figure model. And I, again, I work at many, many, many different schools and private uh, studios and I enjoy that. And sometimes I have a set schedule and sometimes models cancel or don't show up or they forget to schedule somebody and I get called at the last minute to be the emergency replacement model. That happens a lot. And I do probably maybe 20 or 30% of my work is just emergency replacement modeling. And then the 70% is, you know, I'm booked for it. So I find that part a little bit stressful, you know, being called in at the last minute, but I just really like, I like working as a model a lot. So I just keep doing it. I've done it for 24 years. As for medical modeling, I will now switch gears. Okay, so this is Shannon Kringen. You're listening to Goddess Kring, podcast number nine. This is December 15th, 2016, where it's when it's airing. And this show airs on Hollow Earth Radio, Mixcloud, YouTube, Patreon, and Bandcamp. So if you just Google Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, you can find this podcast on all those different websites and it's free to listen to. And uh, it airs on Hollow Earth Radio at a certain time every week. And then on all the other websites, it's it's archived 24 seven free to listen to. And if you like my show, feel free to share it with anyone. So Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Uh, I'm a multimedia artist and the way I make a living is through art modeling. And I wanted to talk about medical modeling. That is what I just did today uh, and the last three days in a row actually. So I worked at one medical school three days this week and another medical school another three days. So that's six out of seven days. And what happens with that is there's two kinds of medical modeling. There's the phys clin kind which is physical clinic where I show up, me and other models, we show up and we put on medical gowns, just like, you know, regular medical gowns. And in the medical schools, they have little examination rooms, just like real, you know, medical rooms that have sinks and medical supplies and special medical examination tables. And we get undressed and we put on our medical gown. And then basically there's a proctor in the room, like a real doctor or a student who's already graduated from the program who kind of has mastered it. And they're in the room to supervise. And we as the medical patient model are also there to supervise. We are there to pretend to be a patient. And today I worked for a department that was learning how to do head to toe examinations. So they checked my temperature my blood pressure, listened to my heart and lungs, palpated my sinuses and my tissues, um, looked inside my nose and my ears, checked my thyroid, looked in my mouth, made sure my teeth and and palate and mouth were healthy. Uh, Then they did breast exams in different positions, sitting up, checked my lymph nodes, had me lie back on the medical examination table and checked my uh, breast tissue. And I've had breast reduction surgery, so I do have scars. They have, I have scars on my breasts and I am um, a good example for students to feel uh, scar tissue and feel what that feels like. And then they do pelvic exams where um, they do like a female pap smear type of an exam but they don't actually take any samples on us as models because that would actually hurt us to have several exams. And if they take samples uh, out of the tissue, that, you know, the cervix, that would be not not good. So what they do is they just do everything else. They use the speculum, they look at all the tissue, and then they just get the instruments out and pretend, okay, I'm gonna take a sample now. And they pretend like they're gonna take a sample, but they don't actually do it. They just pretend and they walk through it And then basically at the end, me and the proctor um, tell the student, we critique the student. We say, okay, you did really well at this and this, but you need to improve on this and this. So basically what the students have to learn how to do is, there's three different things they have to learn how to do. 
one, they have to learn the proper medical terms with patients. You know, they have to learn to say, um, you know, when you examine a woman's uh, private areas, you know, genitalia, you don't say looks good. You say looks healthy, looks normal. Everything looks healthy and normal. And you don't say um, uh, bed, you say table. And you don't say um, sheet, you say drape. So there's different languages. And instead of saying stirrups, you say foot rests. So there's different uh, language and medical terms that they need to learn how to use. And then they're looking for like lesions and abnormalities and like fissures and stuff like that. And I actually like, you know, I know where all my glands are now. I never knew where my ovaries and uterus were before and my cervix. And I know that different um, lymph nodes and tissues are. And I never knew that before. So it's interesting to know there is a crossover, actually, art modeling and medical modeling. It's about the anatomy. And there's skeletons in the room and like charts of the bones and the muscles. And that's like similar with art and medicine both. But when I'm in the room with medical students, they're practicing their language, medical language, and they're thinking of, okay, I'm looking for lesions, I'm looking for something wrong. But they say to the to the patient, I want to make sure everything is normal. I want to make sure you're healthy and there's no ab abnormalities or nothing of concern. And so in their head, they're thinking of all the, the negative things they're looking for. But they're telling the patient everything's healthy, everything's normal, and reassuring the patient. So they have to practice medical language with the patient. And then they also have to practice the physical technique of how to palpate the tissue because some students are too rough when they touch the patient. Some students are too gentle and hesitant. Some students are just right. I think that some medical students are afraid that it's it's uh, flirtatious or sexual when they touch you, and so they sometimes touch you in a way that's too cold and clinical, and then you feel like a cadaver. So basically what medical students need to learn how to do is kind of touch you in a sort of nurturing, therapeutic, medical, professional way that's not too cold, but also not too personal, not too like affectionate, like flirtatious, you know, and inappropriate, but they also need to learn to not be too cold. And if, if they touch you in a way that makes you feel like you're a cadaver, that's no good either. And they have to practice eye contact and, you know, empathy for the patient. And they also have to learn how to use the instruments, learn how to use the stethoscope and the odometer and all the different kinds of things that they, they use different instruments. And so... Ah, today I had my temperature taken and my blood pressure and I had um, my, my reflex were tested, my reflexes, and they checked my skin for edema and pitting and clonus and all kinds of different things that I would never know. So I'm fascinated by working with medical students. Each student is different. Some of them are better at the palpation. Some of them are better at the language. Um, the best students are the ones that are good at all of it. And then there's one more kind of medical modeling that I do, and that is called standardized patient modeling. And that is when they actually give you a script. You show up at the medical school and they give you a script that has a name, an age, it has your blood pressure, it has your lifestyle, it has actual, it's based on real cases and real symptoms. And the medical students have to guess what's wrong with you. So you have to tell them like your story and then you have to wait until you don't tell them too much. You just tell them a little bit about why you're there. And then you have to wait and see if the medical student asks you the right questions so that you can tell them about your family history, your symptoms, your lifestyle. And then the medical students have to do an, an objective and then a subjective, like a list of objective things, a list of subjective things. So like what I tell the doctor is more subjective because that's my opinion. And then the objective is like my blood pressure, you know, the facts, the literal facts that are not disputable. And then they have to come up with three possible diagnoses for what might be wrong with me. And then I think they're supposed to come up with um, th maybe three different uh, treatment plan options like medication, exercise, diet, 
uh, surgery, you know, all the different options for treatment. And what's interesting is that these cases are, these are based on real cases. And so when they practice, when the medical students practice, the, the proctor that's in the room monitoring me and the medical student, they know the real answer. And so they have to see how good the medical student is at making a proper diagnosis and coming up with a proper treatment plan. And so they also have to practice their language with the patient and their palpations and how they touch the patient and make sure that that's professional and medical and caring and yet not too not too touchy-feely, not too personal, and yet not too cold and impersonal. So there's like a fine balance. I would say that I almost feel like medical students should should uh, be required to take a class on massage because I feel like some medical students, when they touch me, it feels very nurturing and very therapeutic, and I feel very reassured and cared about. And then some people touch me and I feel like I'm a cadaver and they're touching me like I'm not really alive. Or maybe they're just hesitating because they, they appear to be nervous and like afraid to really touch me. Maybe some medical students are afraid that it's going to seem flirtatious or too personal or too seductive. Uh, but if you touch somebody and you're not friendly about it, it does, it feels cold and clinical like the person is just touching a cadaver that's not even alive and there's not enough of a connection. So I've found that the, the medical students that are the best at palpating my tissue are the ones that actually touch me like a massage therapist would touch you. Like they want you to be calm and they're, they're firm and confident but not too rough. Not too gentle and not too rough. Kind of like the three little bears just right in the center. So that's kind of how I feel about modeling for medical students is um, after doing this for, gosh, 19 years, I started in 1997 working with med students at one school, and now that's branched off into a second school. So I got into that because of art modeling. Um, the medical school contacted the art school saying, hey, do you have any art models that would be comfortable modeling for the medical students because we're art models are comfortable being nude in front of people. I know that some art models actually don't want to do medical modeling, uh, but some of us do. There is an overlap. There's, there's a comfort with being nude, with being like in an art or medical educational setting. I feel very safe. I feel cared about. I feel like there's a positive um, purpose to what's going on. And so I feel... Uh, safe and secure and I know more about my body now than I ever did because of working with med students as well as art students you know I know some of the names of the bones and the muscles and the tendons and the glands and I never heard the term palpate tissue before I started working with med students and anterior and posterior and latissimus dorsi and there's just some really cool language. Now I can't even remember some of the words, but I like being around med students and hearing them name the name the different uh, glands and tissues and the um, the fornix and the inguinal nodes and the lateral you know tissue and the anterior tissue and the septum and just the different. Uh, the conge congeva, I forgot what it's called. I don't know. There's so many cool terms that the medical students use and the ear canal and they make sure that my eardrum is, is pearlescent, pearly and white. And they tell me how much earwax I have and it's good to know. And uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just an interesting, you know, being a freelance medical model and art model is quite interesting, let me tell you. So it is a freelance job. They call me randomly. Um, sometimes it's the same time every year. Uh, but when I look back at my calendars, I'm amazed at all the different random uh, jobs that I get and different schedules that I have. And I really do respect and admire medical students and art students. And I'm very honored that I can do this for a living, that I can help educate people in this way. And I learn right along with the students so, um, 
somebody wanted me to talk about this. And again, I'm, I'm very comfortable with my body, I guess. I guess I'm really not shy when it comes to my body. I'm a little more shy about talking in front of people, although I love to record these podcasts. So, wow, can you believe that was a 40-minute monologue? Next up, there's going to be some art and music. And if you have any questions or comments or other topics you would like me to speak on, just let me know. I also actually was going to talk about nudism and naturism. I've gone to naturist gatherings in different parts of the country. And basically, figure modeling got me into medical modeling. And figure modeling also got me into naturism and nudism. I'm not really a nudist. I'm more of a naturist. And this is the difference. Um, I know this because I went to Florida to a really cool place called Sun Sport Gardens, which is in Loxahatchee, Florida. And I went to the midwinter naturist gathering three times there. And um, they were talking about the difference between a nudist and a naturist. Now, different people might have different opinions about this, but I agree with the definition that I heard from these people in Florida. They were saying that a nudist is somebody who just, it's it, to them, it's recreational. It's all just about being nude. A lot of times it's about being tan in the sun and having no tan lines. It's about having fun and playing volleyball and just being playful and uh, some nudists go to like swinger type places and it's, it's you know, adult oriented and not kid friendly, not family oriented, but more like erotic and adult oriented. Uh, but it's all about having fun and being nude. And it's, it's different from naturism is, is a little bit of a deeper level to the nudity. Uh, see, nudism is more about just nude for the for the fun of it. And there might even be some sexual, you know, aspect to it, which is fine. Sexuality is part of life. Um, but it's more about um, recreational fun nudity. Whereas naturism is usually more family friendly. It's usually non-sexual in terms of groups that get together. And it is like a safe place for kids to come and is a, and then people are nude, but it's not sexual. There's rules about, you know, if you're with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you want to make out and get sexual, you got to go off and, and be private about that. But when you're with the group at a naturist gathering, it's family friendly and it's also, a, it's not just about being nude for fun. It's about being natural. It's when they say naturist it's like you're natural you're celebrating being part of nature you're thinking of, it's more of a philosophy about the healing power of healing body shame of being nude because you're trying to relax and be natural like other species like like other animals don't wear clothes a lot of them have fur but even the animals that don't have fur that are just nude all the time, they're just nude, they're natural. You know, they eat, they sleep, they do everything nude. They swim, they do everything nude. And it's about being natural. It's about eating healthy. It's about wanting to heal yourself emotionally from any trauma that you have. You know, naturists are generally, I'm stereotyping here, it's not always the case, but generally the naturists, the people that I've met that call themselves naturists are usually into like health food and, and exercise and, and being healthy and also healing body shame, you know, not worrying about what you look like, not worrying about life being a beauty contest and in fact, when people are nude, I think they're a little bit less egotistical and a little bit about the way they look and a little bit less vain, a little bit less worried about trying to impress other people. There's a certain vulnerability in being nude with other people. It's a sort of um, comfortable, relaxed um, naturalness. Let's see. I wanted to say, too, that I... On a more personal level, I don't shave. I actually shave my legs, but nowhere else. So I have natural hair on different body parts, and I don't shave. And, you know, some naturists shave and some don't, and some nudists shave and some don't. But basically, there's just this feeling of um, 
being natural and being relaxed with your body and uh, with, with other people. And the, the, the most wonderful thing about going to a naturist gathering where everybody is nude is swimming. I noticed that when you take a shower and you're, you're, if you're in the pool and you're nude and then you get out of the pool, you don't have to like, you don't have like a swimsuit that's sticking to you. So it's really comfortable to just sort of like hop in the shower after the swimming pool and rinse off and dry off with a towel. And there's no like, everybody's nude. And so nobody's like hiding under their towel. I mean, there's just something so psychologically comforting and nice about just getting in and out of the pool and not being all shy and modest and having to hide your body. You know, there's no hiding your body. You just, not that you're going around flaunting your body but that you're just you're just relaxed and getting in and out of the pool and taking a shower and just sort of wrapping your towel around yourself and drying yourself off but there's no like needing to hide and it's just a really good feeling it's 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 relaxing if if you're listening and you've never done this uh, maybe find a naturist place in your area and see what it's like um, I find it very comfortable and very kind of, it feels very normal to me and it doesn't feel strange. Uh, but again, I got into it sort of backwards. I started as a figure model for artists and then medical model and then the naturist gatherings uh, sort of happened after that because I met this person that was involved and he invited me. He's like, hey, would you like to go to uh, Sunsport Gardens in Florida and relax at this naturist gathering and I went like okay and so I did that three times and I really enjoyed that met some really nice people um, and my favorite thing about Sunsport Gardens in Loxahatchee Florida is the 24-hour heated pool and they have Christmas lights hanging above the pool and it's just so fun to swim at night especially because there's there's basically uh, no no risk of sunburn when you're swimming at night so this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. That was my 47-minute monologue. Next up, let's listen to some music and or poetry. Thanks for tuning in to Goddess Kring Radio. This is the podcast we call Goddess Kring. I'm Shannon Kringen, your host. Thanks for tuning in. Please write me with questions or comments. You can go to shannonkringen.com to find my email. You can actually, my email is kringgoddess at yahoo.com. I'll just say that once. <laughs> um, hey, is there anybody listening? I'll say one more thing on this huge epic monologue. Is there anyone out there? Is there anyone out there who knows WordPress? I actually use front page, which is obsolete, to create and edit my website. Shannonkringen.com is a beautiful website that I've had for 16 years uh, but I will admit it's kind of a mess and mostly what I want to use my shannonkringen.com for is a platform to link to all my other websites because I have a, a live journal, a WordPress, a Tumblr, a Flickr, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Bandcamp, Mixcloud, you know, lots and lots and lots of LinkedIn, lots of websites where I share my artwork and my music and my words. And my main website just kind of hooks it all together. So does anybody out there know how to how to edit websites with WordPress? I'm, I might like try to teach myself how to redesign my website. I want to be able to um, update it myself from home. So does anybody out there know WordPress, like a free template for WordPress, and I need to hook it into my host and try to improve my website. ShannonKringa.com is my site. And again, it's kind of messy. I've got tons and tons of stuff on there, and I would like to organize it and streamline it and freshen it up and make it more uh, user-friendly. Thank you for listening. Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen. pre be morphic eyes locked, several heartbeats, contrasting monotheistic beyond the duality of heaven and hell. There's an invisible world of form. Equal weight is given to silence. 
silence, 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 waiting at the gate, waiting at the gate, skating at the skating at the state of bliss, interlacing geranium, painting titanium, clean slate island, beyond rocky paradox, curling the law, curling the law, realizing the hawks are taking stock of what the humans do, due to earth equanimous. Multi-dimensional shadow spell, Fukushima dwell, swell to wave, swelling melon are you brave? Flying turquoise, painted bodies, head to toe, in the amber glow of knowing, the show must go on. Unwind the tie, Unwind the tie. Sliding, in sliding in line, silhouetted time, silhouetted time. Silhouetted mining time. creative mind, lining torso divine, gluten free, gluten free, clear to fog of mind, shedding long ago skin for a window of play. No longer delay, no longer delay. Displaying, displaying full spectral full chroma, spectral chroma. Soaking, in aroma. soaking in aroma, sensing so serendipity, serendipity. serendipity. Dancing this Dancing synchronicity, synchronicity. Road, less traveled road less in dreams, water seed, water seed. Water Sprouting, sprouting, routing, encountering collaboration, adoration, elated by the vastship of friendship. What a trip, what a trip, what a trip, what a trip. Dipping into the golden retreat. Hey, that was a spoken word piece I created called Bahamian Morphic Field. I wrote that poem in response to, in 2014, I flew to the Bahamas to work with an amazing photographer slash body painter artist named Monty Knowles. If you just Google Monty Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, Monty, M-O-N-T-Y, Monty Knowles photography, you'll see really beautiful images of, uh, people that he's body painted. He is a native of the Bahamas and I, <clears throat> excuse me, and I met him online and got to do a photo shoot with him. He body painted me. It took seven hours for him to paint me from head to toe and he took some really beautiful photos of me. I'm somebody who models for photographers on occasion and I, I will admit that I think the best photos of me are the ones I take of myself. Uh, partly because I'm more comfortable alone working solo and I'm the kind of person that's photogenic if the lighting is good and the angle is good and I need the photographer to kind of work with me in a certain way to to bring the best out in me as a model. So I have done some amazing work with a few different photographers and so that was a poem um, partly from my experiences in the Bahamas. I went to Nassau for about 10 days I think and stayed uh, on a boat and he's even a pilot he has a pilot's license and a small Cessna plane he flew me to another island called Abaco and had some amazing experiences there with photos and body painting and um, yeah it's all linked to my website so now let's listen to more Spoken word art by me, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. I'm actually getting ready to fly to California. I'm going to go visit some relatives in Santa Barbara for a few days. And then my next podcast, hopefully, will be an interesting monologue about my travels to California and maybe my trips to Europe and my trips to Mexico, Australia, various places I've been. Tame the shame. Suck the sugar cane. Tame the shame. Suck the sugar cane. Suicide divides lines of time. Cutting ties to light it divine. Erased spaces simply reappear. Disappearance a big illusion in this hour. Empowered by a tower. Tame the shame. Suck the sugar cane. 
suiting up your relatives with armor, amour, armor, amour. Having tea with a goat farmer, tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Tapping that inner child on the shoulder, maybe she just wants you to hold her. What's in your scream box? Unlock that box. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Take the risk, you fear facer. Graced by an embrace. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Jump the mobile unlimited. Invoke the friendly spinning spoke. Unspoken allowed to be seen. Jetting international. No need to be rational. Flexible as the new stable. Labels outdated. It's prorated. Be elated. One more time. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Assess suicide divides. Okay, do it again. Sa 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 sa. No, don't want to do that way. It sounds stupid. Okay. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Suicide divides lines of time, cutting ties to lighted divine. Erased spaces simply reappear. Disappearance, a big illusion in this hour, empowered by a tower. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Suit up your relatives with armor, a more armor, a more. Having tea with a goat farmer. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Tapping that inner child on the shoulder. Maybe she just wants you to hold her. What's in your scream box? Unlock that box. Tame the shame, tame the shame, tame the shame. Take the risk. You fear facer, graced by an embrace. Intimacy chasing me, feel like it's erasing me. No. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Tame the shame, suck the sugar cane. Intimacy chasing me, feel like it's erasing me. No. Graced by an embrace. Intimacy facing me. Not erasing me, intimacy facing me, not erasing me. Jump the mobile unlimited. Invoke the friendly spinning spoke. Unspoken allowed to be seen. Jetting international. No need to be rational. Flexible as the new stable. Labels outdated. It's prorated. Be elated. Tame the shame. Tame the shame. Tame the shame. The end. It's prorated. Be elated. This is Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring. What you just heard was a poem I wrote called Tame the Shame, Suck the Sugar Cane. So I have a lot of personal demons and issues and various uh, things that I challenge me in my psyche, my brain, my mental, emotional health. And so that's a poem that acknowledges some of that. So I'm going to head to California, Santa Barbara, California, to be exact, to visit some relatives, um, three different relatives that live there who invited me to come and visit them, and I will take photos on the ocean, and I might update my, um, I have a uh, an audio thingy McJagger I do called Anchor, 
and I probably will update my anchor and I will update my Instagram and my Twitter and my Facebook and various uh, social media websites. So I'll see you next week. I'll have a new podcast number 10 a week from December 15th. High bloom, high bloom, roots, in cahoots, in cahoots. Sliding, doors, sliding doors, eyes adore, eyes adore. ocean beam, ocean. come clean, come clean, manifesting, manifesting dreams. Manifesting, dreams. Manifesting. Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Goddess Kring, Goddess Kring, Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Goddess Kring, Goddess Kring.